Speaking of generations to come, one person that will be part of uh, generations to come is a young man by the name of Will Shackle, 18 years of age, Brisbane schoolboy, and he's been at the forefront of Nuclear for Australia. That's the website if you want to check it out. He's spoken to us before on Mornings, and I'm happy to say uh, he joins us again. Good morning, Will. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. I appreciate your time again. Now, you've probably had a chance to catch a little bit of Peter Dutton's speech this morning and his big announcement. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? You'd no doubt be... It'd be welcome to your ears, I'd imagine. Yes, we, we think it's a really positive development that a major political party in Australia is currently making some progress in the nuclear discussion. But what we think most important at this time is that there's a bipartisan effort to embrace nuclear power from people from all sides of politics. There is no reason why we can't have the Labor Party and the Teals also behind nuclear power. It's a zero emissions, always on reliable, eco-friendly technology. Um, And we think at this time that there needs to be some unity from all sides of politics if they seriously want to end the climate wars. Well, it just creates confusion. And I might imagine if there's uh, a lot of industry and businesses that are putting all their eggs in the renewables basket and trying to get their money together to make that transition, and if they hear this now and think, well, if there's a change of government next year, what happens then? I imagine all this indecision, and I, I agree with you, I agree this needs to be bipartisan. I imagine hearing this now, they may be thinking, well, hang on, we'll just tap the brakes here because we don't know which way we're going to go. We could be putting all our money towards renewables and we may end up having to pivot and go to nuclear. So I think it's vital that they get a bipartisan mm-hmm. agreement on this. 100%. I think the most important thing to say is that You know, this is our position, and I would assume by what the coalition was implying, this is also a position that they hopefully share, is that we're not just talking about switching completely over to nuclear. It should be a balanced energy mix. We should have all options on the table, and that's something that most nations around the world are able to do. When you look to the US and UK and all of these other countries that we call our partners, uh, they, are all, they all have the option of nuclear power, and that's really important for Australia because we don't have that option. We're the only member of the G20 currently with a ban on nuclear power, so we're not able to even consider it. And that's what we're going to be uh, making really, really clear, is that the first priority must be to lift the nuclear bans. They're outdated, out of touch, uh, from the bygone era of the 90s, um, and they must be lifted today. If we actually, if politicians, you know, are serious about lowering emissions, lowering power bills, and actually acting on climate change, then there is no reason why they would keep on defending uh, the ban on nuclear power. That's a good point you make. None of what Peter Dutt's announcing today is possible unless that is overturned. Is that correct? Yes. And what's also true and what some commentators picked up on last night is that, you know, in our state of Queensland, uh, we've also got a local ban on nuclear power from the state government. In addition, actually, we also have a uranium mining ban. So there's multiple uh, legal hurdles. But the thing is that, you know, these could be lifted very, very quickly. It would Mm. only take a vote in Parliament for these bans to be lifted on nuclear power, and they should be lifted. There's no social licence. The majority of Australians support nuclear power, and they want the option for it. So currently that is a hurdle. Can you answer some of the... We've had a a chat this morning to Dave Copen. He's from the Queensland Conservation Council. Naturally, he's on the opposite side Mm -hmm. of the fence, and he raised a few points, and I thought, well, I I said to our listeners, well, have you want to maybe answer some of these. Uh, He threw a whole bunch of hurdles on the table. You can't have both these energy sources running in tandem at the same time, different transmission sources. There's a longer lead time for nuclear power plants as opposed to your wind and solar, your renewables. And the fuel for these nuclear sites is far too risky. And what about the waste? So they were just a few of the things that were brought up in opposition to nuclear. Well, I think you first have to start off by looking at the fact that nuclear has demonstrated that it's effective in the 32 countries around the world that currently use it and the 50 50 countries that are looking to use it for the first time. If those were serious issues, uh, those countries wouldn't be interested in nuclear power. And to be honest, there wouldn't have been those 25 countries at COP28, the Global Climate Conference, which would have signed up for it. A few quick points. Uh, First of all, in terms of the safety and the fuel, I know that those conservation groups have been running some disinformation campaigns where they're posting AI-generated images of glowing green koalas. 
Uh, for people who are aware of nuclear power's strong safety culture, that isn't true. I actually flew down to Sydney today. I probably got more radiation on my flight down to Sydney from Brisbane than I would uh, living near a nuclear power station for a year. So that's just a start. Uh, nuclear power plants can be deployed quickly. That's been demonstrated around the world. France was able to build something like 50 in the space of nine years. Uh, and also, in addition to that, France, again, has demonstrated that nuclear can work with renewables, and that's the most important thing here. No nation's running off 100% nuclear, and I don't think anyone is suggesting that that would be the case in Australia. But there's a really important role that nuclear power can play, and nuclear power can, uh, contrary to popular belief, actually complement renewables uh, and ramp up and ramp down. Even Bill Gates, uh, a few days ago, started construction uh, on a reactor called Natrium, which is going to be using uh, using tanks, which will provide storage, very much like a battery. Mm -hmm. but the nuclear power station will heat those, and then when the power is needed, when the, uh, the renewables aren't producing enough electricity, they'll be able to produce the electricity from those tanks. So there are so many solutions, uh, and it certainly shouldn't rule out a uh, discussion about nuclear power. And waste? Waste. Waste. So what about the waste? Australia currently manages low and intermediate level waste safely, and we have done so for decades. Uh, in terms of the spent fuel, which would be the new uh, thing brought in if we had civil nuclear power reactors, so Australia does have a nuclear reactor, albeit it's a research reactor at Lucas Heights, 30 kilometres away from Sydney. That produces spent nuclear fuel because once the fuel is used, um, you know, obviously it has to go somewhere. Currently, that's reprocessed in France and it's sent back and we manage that. So it's not really a new issue for Australia. We're going to have to deal with it with the AUKUS submarine announcement. But the most important thing when talking about spent fuel or high-level nuclear waste, which is really what they're talking about, uh, is the fact that it is safe. There have never been any, uh, you know, effect on human life from waste management. You can look up, there's pictures of pregnant women uh, hugging canisters of it. Uh, then th there's also the fact that it's an incredibly small volume. All of the high-level waste spent fuel around the world could easily fit inside the MCG. So it's a tiny issue we're talking about. And the last and really important thing is it can be reprocessed. So when people say, oh, the nuclear waste will last for 100,000 years and have a toxic effect on future generations, and I guess they're talking down to myself at that point, uh, they're forgetting the fact that nuclear waste can be reprocessed a third of nuclear waste around the world is reprocessed, albeit it is a bit more expensive. But, you know, with the rate of uh, technological advancements and scientific development, I don't think uh, it's reasonable to say that there is going to be a long-term issue with nuclear waste when there's so many solutions for it. So it's just a bit of a misinformation campaign. It's almost like a smear campaign to say otherwise. You know, you've pretty much debunked every every reason that um, the, the, the Queensland Conservation Council gave this morning for why it mm. shouldn't be brought forward. And I asked him the question, I said, well, can you give me an example of a nation anywhere in the world that is completely run on renewables? And the answer was no. I thought, well, hello. <laughs> I think, I think that's very telling because it just hasn't happened. Uh, and I think, to be honest, I'm being really disappointed with the conservation groups. They're meant to stand up for nature. And if they realise that nuclear power had some of the lowest mining and land use of any energy source, I would have thought that the facts alone would be able to convince them to support it. But unfortunately, as people will very quickly learn, they are running a huge fear campaign against nuclear power. And that's why we need all of our all of the support we can get with Nuclear for Australia. We're trying to share the facts with people uh, before this fear campaign infiltrates through the uh, community. So I just ask all of your listeners, if they can support us, chip in some money, sign our petition to go to nuclearforaustralia.com. It makes a lot of sense. And you're 18 years of age, people can't, I haven't, shouldn't lose sight of. I mean, <laughs> I was never doing anything or as passionate and knowledgeable about anything at 18. You're, uh, you're marvellous to have a chat to. Uh, it's a credit to you, Will. So you've just said all of that and laid it on the table. So essentially, mm. if we bust it down to another layer below the efficiency and, uh, and the lack of risk, if people are just going, you know what, if you're sitting at home now, swamped in bills, feeling stressed with cost of living, and they just want cheap power, they want power that's good for the planet, and they want power that they know is going to be reliable and be on and give baseload power into the future for not just the next election cycle, but for the next 50, 60, 100 years, there's no reason. This has to be in the mix. It has to be an option. 
Absolutely. All right. Great to talk with you. Thanks for uh, jumping off a plane and having a chat. No doubt we'll talk soon. Good. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, too. Will Shackle, what a magnificent young man. What a credit to his family and uh, and uh, his school as well. A lot to be proud of. And it just makes it sound... He just breaks down all of the myths. And as he said, this massive fear campaign that's going on against nuclear...